true beauty is the highest currency we have. No, without it, she would be nothing. I think you're wrong. Excuse me? I said I think you're wrong. Well, so are you gonna tell me that it's what's inside that counts? Yeah, that's exactly what I think. Well, I think that if she wasn't beautiful, you wouldn't have even stopped to look. Hi folks, I'm Ignati Vishnevetsky. And I'm Alex Dowd. We're here in our personal ref and space, here in the AV Club office. Welcome to Film Club. So, The Neon Demon is a film that was very poorly received at Cannes, and having just seen it, I sort of have a sense why. You know, you and I both know that there's a very particular, that Cannes is an incubator of a very particular kind of reaction, and very particular kind of strong reactions. And I think it's much more fun than those boos warranted. Well, absolutely. But I will, I will say that it's, um, the reaction to it's a little unusual because Reffin's drive did very, very well there. Mm -hmm. So you've got this kind of fairy tale vision of Los Angeles. Al Fanning, she's playing a 16-year-old girl. We're told that she's an orphan. We, we don't really ever find out whether that's true, but she's living out of this motel in Los Angeles. She becomes kind of a rising star in the fashion world. And that should really be put in quotes because you don't really see a lot of people, you don't see reactions. This is just the most of... abstract vision of any culture you can imagine. Yeah, because it's just big like warehouse, like empty rooms with a person at a desk nodding. <laughs> like the... four human beings conveying the information about this world. So you've got this very archetypal story treated, I mean, a very fairy tale like fashion. You have Elle Fanning in these kind of pastoral dresses looking at the moon and the stars. Yeah. In some ways, this is as much a minimalist genre riff as drive. It's very deliberate. I mean, even more deliberate than Only God Forgives. And yet, I feel like it has a few things going for it. First of all, it's actually really funny and a lot more aware of itself than I think maybe some people gave it credit. But it, I mean, it takes place in this incredibly artificial world, mm -hmm. right? It's his quote unquote, look at the fashion industry. But yeah. it, is, it is set in a world that is even more stylized than the, you know, the universe you kind of get in Only God Forgives or in Drive. Sure. Well, I mean, this, his version of Los Angeles is even more depopulated than Terrence Malick's version in mm -hmm. Nine of Cups. I mean, this is a movie where there never seems to be anybody on the street where our characters are sort of existing in the, these these little vortexes of, of silence and yeah well because yeah. the sound mix is really really yeah weird. yeah yeah it's so um, quiet there's, when, there's when the music isn't when this tangerine dream style score isn't blaring it's a very very quiet film you just yeah. assume that every character is a vampire the entire yeah. film you know that they're about to say like oh we're a cabal of vampires oh, I mean they're absolutely I mean they're, they're they're coded as vampires from the start mm -hmm. I mean there's a lipstick brand called red rum mm -hmm. their mouths are always smeared with lipstick to look like these bloody maws yeah. you know and there's this constant you know they ask her very early in the movie are you sex or are you food yeah you know I mean there's this whole vampire idea this is a very old idea but Los Angeles as this force that just Praise an old and women. hoary idea, and this very is not, hoary, this is not yeah. a not a film of with anything fresh, no, or very deep. No, Refn is not. I've never I've never thought of Refn as a deep thinker, and this film is basically riffing on that very old idea that that Los Angeles will suck the life out of you. And yet, I found it kind of captivating. Oh, me too. Transfixing. Even. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost. I mean, there's a point where it jumps the rails, and I sort yeah. of I saw it like, okay, this is this is why so many of our colleagues hated this film yeah. at its premiere. There is a point where it totally jumps the rails, and I was like, okay, it's sort of it's like jumps the rails, and then it just keeps going and going and going and going and going off in that direction, it does, and then yeah. it's sort of I got back on. You got again. back on. I, yeah. I caught up with yeah. the runaway train and. I will say that this, that watching this, I thought, uh, wow, I don't think I would be half as compelled by this if I saw this on like a little screen, you know, if I was yeah. watching this on my laptop or yeah, something, absolutely. right? And I've always found that the ref in films I saw first in the theater, I find a lot more compelling or yeah, I yeah. find myself a lot more drawn to because you're sort of trapped with them. I feel like this film has a lot in common with Only God Forgives in the sense that it's basically Everything in it is kind of faded. Basically, the plot is just w one ceremony. Like, we're building yeah. up to one one ceremony of bodily harm, which is not a, at all a, a complex metaphor. Yeah. But I feel like this takes it 
maybe even further. I think something about Los Angeles really uh, encourages him to embrace these archetypes too, you mm -hmm. know. And this, uh, the Neon Demon is this super archetypal story of, you know, of sort of the, the babe in the woods who comes to. Well, this is kind yeah. of his like showgirls all about Eve. <laughs> right, right. It's very much yeah, yeah, yeah. his showgirls. And, well, I mean and a little bit of Mulholland Drive as well. Yeah, but, and the, the, but, yeah quite yeah, a bit yeah. of Mulholland Drive. Uh, but Lynch's films are sort of, uh, and especially Mulholland Drive, sort of embraces the irrational dream logic, where this is a film that's very clear in every moment what it's trying to say. Speaking of movies featuring grievous, symbolic, bodily harm, we've got a Swiss Army Man opening this week as well. Right, another film that premiered to a kind of divisive response at a festival. It world premiered at Sundance this year. Its claim to initial fame was that there were waves of walkouts at the big gala premiere. Swiss Army Man is this sort of bizarre buddy comedy that, that the sort of easy log line on it is that it's sort of Weekend at Bernie's meets Castaway, you know? And you have, yeah, Dano as this, as this shipwreck survivor, Daniel Radcliffe as this corpse that washes up on, uh, on the beach. And at first you wonder, is Radcliffe's entire involvement in this project going to be playing this this dead body? Yeah, and then know? he just lugs around. <laughs> right, right. Which has all kinds of, I mean, amazing abilities, right? Right. He, he has powerful, powerful built-up gases in his in his intestines that can be used in the manner of a rocket. <laughs> he uh, has an erection that works as, as a, a compass. As a compass, yep. <laughs> yeah, and he can also regurgitate large amounts of clean, fresh water. <laughs> so it's like it's like a gross out buddy comedy with elements of a therapeutic drama. Mm -hmm. And at times it seems to be sort of spoofing the whimsical the, the, the whimsical dramedies of somebody like Michelle Gondry. I mean, they're building. I'm not these... sure they're spoofing. I think it's just think it's, it's totally just straight Gondry esque whimsy. And I'll I'll tell you why. And I, I like that yeah. stuff in in, in Gondry a mm -hmm. lot. But here, those were the moments when the film sort of began to lose me. Okay. A little bit where you've got uh, the Paul Dano character building, you know, these like mock ups of buses and mm -hmm. restaurants out of trash that he finds very quickly in montages, and it was like, oh, it was like, it was a corpse found by Gael Garcia Bernal's character from The Science of Sleep. You know, that's, <laughs> right. that's the plot of this movie. I think the film is playing on those conventions a little bit and playing on audiences' familiarity with that particular class of, of indie cinema. And it's sort of filtering it through a kind of deranged mind. Do you think so? Because I feel like those yeah. are the most sincere parts of the film. Because mm -hmm. there is a very sincere, there's a part of this film that's very sincere and just about like kind of millennial relationships. Mm -hmm. And then a part of it that has this kind of childlike wish fulfillment mm -hmm. side to it. But I, I, I feel like it ends up becoming about, I don't know, the, the fact that the world that people sort of create for themselves is really what what matters more than quote unquote a reality. Mm -hmm. And it's ultimately that world that wins out at the end, which is again a very Gondry kind of right. uh, kind of lesson. I mean, I think a big part of why this film works for me is that it feels a little bit like an experiment and in investment. Can you take this, this essentially very ludicrous premise mm -hmm. and this sort of crass, gross out premise and can you invest it with emotional honesty and can you get the audience invested? And I think a big part of that is the performances. Um, and I think that they both are really committed to making, as silly as it sounds, to making these people characters. Even mm -hmm. Radcliffe, who does some very funny physical comedy as Manny. I should say that uh, starting out, it sort of seemed like, you know, maybe during the first 15, 20 minutes of the film, I'm like, oh, this is so like, I hate to be Paul Dano, because this is so clearly Radcliffe's show, right? Yeah, because yeah. he's the one who sort of, yeah, has the weekend at Bernie's role mm -hmm. here. It's a very physically demanding performance. And then I actually found myself more impressed by Dan because okay. he's because a, a big part of what basically ends up happening is they're they're in the woods, they're sort of sifting through all of this refuse of civilization, and he's you know he's teaching his new corpse friend all about the world. Is that he ends up playing all of these roles, mm -hmm. including uh, sort of playing this this projected perfect girlfriend mm -hmm. to, to Radcliffe. So he spends like about a third of the movie in drag, and he's playing his own idea of this character. And it's a, I mean, it's a very complicated role. Yeah. It's very complicated sort of from both sides. It sort of ends up being really as much a showcase for both of those actors as it does for the, the directors, Daniels, as they, yeah, the Daniels. As they credit yeah, themselves, yeah. as for their sort of imaginative handmade aesthetic. Yeah. 